education and peace heroes and heroines are doing extraordinary things in the world and oftentimes we don't hear about it at time i would like this video to be shared and um, expose people to different possibilities to different options of education these tools and practices are working on human rights, gender equality, mediation processes from around the world. So I encourage people to use them and share them and invent new ones and send them to us. So we are meeting in Basel, which represent a true culture of peace for me. It's between three countries and it was able to be in the eye of a storm for as long as European history exists. Um, this house is the place where Prussia and France uh, signed a, a, a peace agreement or an agreement that divide the Rhine between those two countries. I was growing up in a post-conflict era and my family had been impacted by partition um, of uh, India, the 1947 partition, and I grew up hearing stories about the other side, how the other side had uh, massacred them, had uh, raped their women, had uh, looted their homes, and had displaced them basically and made them refugees. So I grew up with a lot of hate for the other side, and my history textbooks also reinforced that image. Uh, but for the first time when I came to, uh, for my further studies to the US, I met somebody from the other side. And when we started sharing our personal stories, I realized that the, the victims on my side were actually the perpetrators on her side. And I, you know, those sort of the connections that we started making through that sharing, I thought there was much more there. And uh, we started working together um, and really began to work with youth and educators around uh, building spaces and platforms where people could share those spaces, personal stories across conflict not just within their conflict, because it is about opening those boundaries. I work these days a lot with uh, politicians and political advisors in uh, Eastern Europe, in post-Soviet countries of Eastern Europe. And so the, the challenge is, how does one translate peace education methodologies um, to working with people who um, clearly feel that they're already uh, very well educated and, uh, and fully prepared for um, uh, their, their tasks at hand? Uh, so. Uh, We've been working uh, together with a, a great team um, on uh, creating what we call peer exchange opportunities um, to learn from other contexts, from other peace processes and other conflict resolution processes, um, and to be able to apply the lessons that others um, have identified, um, the mistakes that others have made and the successes that others have had um, to the situations in post-Soviet Eastern Europe. What's very important to me is that uh, societies can learn from each other. So we can indeed uh, look at how situations of conflicts and violence are handled in other societies, other uh, cultures. This is something that happened already back in the 50s when the US civil rights movements looked at a very different part of the globe in order to uh, set up their own instruments of uh, civil resistance, namely to Gandhi's India. And at that time it wasn't really, um, it was an exploration and it was not something automatic. Nowadays we say Gandhi and Martin Luther King, etc. But when it started it was something completely new and it was a learning from a very different societal experience. How does, how does one not reinvent the wheel when faced with the challenge of violent conflict? Um, how does one uh, identify uh, those pieces um, in a patchwork quilt that could be useful for um, the context that they're, that they're working in. How do these politicians learn from other politicians, from other negotiators, um, from people who've been through something similar, although it's never the same, there are never models as such, but there are similarities and there are lessons that can be learned. And we've been trying to set up that human connection through telling stories, um, through sharing uh, those personal experiences, at a, between very high level people, between people who um, normally we think of them as institutions, uh, but we've been trying to connect them as human beings. As always in situations of violence, you meet people who want to do something and to be constructive. This 
persons and organizations in Mexico have developed what they call interruption. So meaning they uh, retain their ties and friendships with uh, people who are still in the gangs. Many activists are former gang members or leaders who have then chosen to get out of, the, uh, of crime, but have retained those uh, friendships. So they are able to intervene very quickly in a matter of a few hours when there is a situation in danger of escalating, which means killing people. Human beings are about stories. We um, are informed by our stories as much as we inform the stories that we talk about our lives and selves. I still notice that when people get together, it's the stories that connect people. The purpose of the symposium is to bring people who are doing diverse peace, gender, human rights mediation work together to exchange idea, to deconstruct um, different prejudices and stereotypes we have on ourselves and reconstruct them in relation to the relationships that we are able to create here. So to exchange views and theories and, and translate them together to how it manifests in actual practice. My work has primarily been dealing with ethnic conflict, a deeply intractable conflict that has gone on for so long and one of the outcomes of it going on for so long is that people assume that there is no end and therefore one of the prevailing cultures is that of fatalism and the role of the educator in a case like that is how do you overcome fatalism? What language can you use that will give people the comfort that perhaps they can stop contemplating their navels and begin to look above the parapet? I was never conscious of using any methodologies. Um, most of what I did was instinctive. You're living in a particular context, how do you react to that context? What is important about, about our work is that in Cyprus there is a wall. What we do is not actually to deconstruct the wall because this is very difficult. There are contextual conditions that do not allow us a civil society to bring about structural changes at this point. But what we do is that we remove the first brick so that people can have a peek at each other and start feeling that, okay, the people who live on the other side of the buffer zone, on the other side of the checkpoint, they are people with us, we have similarities, but we also have a lot of differences that we have to celebrate, accept, and use to enrich our lives, our personalities, our everyday practices. One very successful example is to send our members, and these are women from local level, who, whom we put together with a high delegation at the highest level on the continent to go to Tanzania, where Tanzania has an issue with its border. It's actually a river which keeps moving and shifting. So that means that the populations are actually very confused and the resources are confused. Are they for Tanzania this season? And then the next season, is it Malawi, the neighbor? We have money to send our local women together with the high-level representatives of the African Union to sit with the parties that are involved, the governments of the two countries, the local communities and others, other third parties, to try and find a way out. I would always start with practice and then you have to think, how does the practice become theory? You know, you start with a concrete issue where people think very, very simply and think in binary terms. And how do you move that into a theoretical position? We had incidents where the kids went back to the school after meeting uh, people from the other community and they were telling their experiences to their parents and their brothers and their sisters, which is the multiplier effect in our efforts of peace education. We also had children who, after the first workshop we did in their own language in their school, in order to prepare them for conduct, we are looking up words on Google Translate for the other language in order to understand what their friends would be saying in the bicommunal workshop. Even though uh, formally educated in theory, uh, I learned early on to avoid theory as much as possible when dealing with day-to-day -day people. 
Uh, one of the books that influenced me most was a book called The Social Sciences as Sorcery, where in fact we social scientists used obfuscatory language. And if you use that, you're not getting through to your auditor. So it was trying to avoid as much of that as possible. And it was very interesting that the two governments I'm talking about asked for the women members of FEMWISE to stay within the room and hammer out the, the solution. And they asked the high delegation to kindly move out of the room. And they kept the women. My educational background is art, political science, gender and peace education, but it's also my passions. My, the things that I'm passionate about is art and human connection and equality. So we were trying to bring together um, different innovating tools that use different forms of arts and crafts and ideas into peace education, gender work and uh, intersectional analysis. So for example, Gordon Mitchell used pictures that people took and created speech bubbles to change the discourse about how we talk about it and how do we evaluate it. What did we say and what didn't we say and allow people to um, have a second chance integrating the, the, the things that they didn't say in writing. to focus on um, different issues that uh, I'm dealing with when I'm teaching MA courses. So our MA students are a very diverse bunch of people. Um, most importantly, they not necessarily come with an academic background as like a traditional university academic background. So there are graduate, there will be graduates of um, uh, teacher colleges. Um, they often come from families who um, don't have an academic background, meaning they are first generation. And that makes uh, uh, a whole uh, different issues around language and how you make academic um, language concept jargon accessible to those who don't necessarily had that background uh, in their previous studies or in the family background, class background, and, and so on and so forth. We all, depending on our context, have different things that give us power and privilege or take away power and privilege. For example, race, social class, gender, sexuality, um, able-bodied different abilities, all these kinds of categories, and they contribute to how society sees us and how we exist within society. The challenge is to convince uh, teachers about the value and the importance and the relevance of uh, inclusion and inclusive education because most of the teachers are feeling very stressed uh, because they have a lot of responsibilities, they don't know how to deal with the heterogeneity in the class. So part of what I try to do in my peace education work is really engage my students in that conversation and what does power and privilege look like in your space and what does social justice look like in that space and what can we do for social justice in order to achieve those goals. So this is something that I was really, um, um, I really dealt with in the past few years and trying to be reflective of thinking of how to make language accessible, non-exclusive uh, to those who don't have access to it, but without uh, reducing the level of the conversation, without dumbing down the conversation. I worked at the University of Education in Freiburg in Germany and uh, the German education system is very challenging uh, in terms of uh, being very hierarchical um, and we worked in a project dealing with Förderschulen or Sonderschulen where the pupil don't have any political education systematically and what we did is was to develop school curricula for um, for these Sonderschüler uh, in terms of enhancing social skills and uh, human rights education. Um, but the most important thing out of the way that we've designed this curriculum is that the modules are what we call informal learning, um, uh, not in the sense where somebody's lecturing 
up the trainees and telling them this is how we do things, but it's very participatory and trainees have the freedom to contribute to the learning process as much as possible. The other thing is um, explaining and, and, and clarifying terms in a natural way as part of the routine class uh, lesson plan um, and, and not waiting for someone to ask and not making them feel they are, should, have done, should have known something that they don't know. And, and the third thing is actually challenging the use of jargon and explaining how it relates to power relations and how it acts as a gatekeeper. Most people have a really hard time challenging themselves to really analyze their own power and privilege. It can be a very confronting experience. And for those that come from communities where they haven't had it, that can be even more difficult um, because everyone wants to feel like they have all the possibilities in the world and recognizing that it might be harder for you is not pleasant either. Well, the teachers appreciate it a lot um, because they see how the, a certain group of society is excluded from the education system, especially in terms of democracy. It is, it is a real problem uh, because these people are not represented in any kind of party or association or they don't even have the uh, impression that they have a voice, that they have a right to speak or that they, for example, if we made uh, some surveys and what the children uh, pointed out was that politics is something for politicians or for people from academia and not something that they belong to. And this is re really a big issue uh, in terms of democracy and democratic education. As a kind of methodology of sorts, if I may call it that, uh, that goes throughout all the tools, all the modules, all, all the exercises, is one that uh, decolonizes the education process, decolonizes the whole pedagogy of the way young people uh, learn and teach others about their experiences and what it means for them to be active youth citizens or uh, active youth leaders within their communities. I'm trying to translate a pedagogy of space into organized tours that I'm conducting. And we are gonna visit a place, a Christmas market, and we're gonna conduct a race, ethnic, religion, gender, age, status, and uh, ability analysis, and see how those um, characteristics and theories are translated to different elements within the Christmas market. Where do you feel safe? Where do you feel unsafe? What, are, what access do you have and control you have to different um, things that are sold or shared or given within the Christmas market? What food can you eat and what foods can't you eat? And is there an option for people who are, for example, keeping a halal belief or kosher um, diet? Um, how many children are in the Christmas market and who takes responsibility on them and why? Um, do people with wheelchair or with mental disabilities are welcome at the Christmas market? Do we see people from diverse ethnicities and background, diverse ages? Do we see only heterosexual families or also homosexual families in what way? they're perceiving the Christmas market. So we're going to take all of that and we'll intersect it with ethnicity and race and see what comes up from that and talk about spaces and what kind of educational lessons we learn and teach within spaces. So I encounter a problem in my work which is antagonism towards gender discourse, gender analysis, and even the concept of gender. I'm using a um, practical educational methodology that I invented to counter that, where I invite people to give a gender analysis to a daily object. They bring whatever object they use from shaving razors to knife, to hamburger, to cigarettes and Coca-Cola bottle, and see how it influenced and influencing men and women differently. 
The gender analysis for everyday object allow me as a professor and my students to integrate gender discourse within the curriculum of our class, but also within their daily life, in their activism, in peace negotiations, see what kind of access men and women have to the same situation and how the same situation affects them fundamentally different. I work in training in Israel. ואחד התחומים שככה במשך השנים הבנתי את החשיבות שלו זה תוכנית הלימודים הסמויה. אחת השאלות שמעניין לשאול למשל היא מי לא מיוצג בחוברות העבודה. אנחנו כמעט ולא נראה אנשים עם נכויות בחוברות העבודה. בחוברות עבודה של ילדים יהודים לא נראה כמעט ערבים. שאלה נוספת שאפשר לשאול איך מאופיינות הדמויות. אנחנו רואים אפיונים מאוד ברורים של בנות עם חצאיות ובגדים ורודים. שאוהבות לשחק משחקים מסוימים שנחשבים משחקים של בנות, ואנחנו רואים בנים עם בגדים של בנים עוסקים בספורט של בנים. אנחנו נראה הרבה פעמים את המגדר מופיע גם בעיסוקים של ההורים. אמהות מבשלות, אמהות נמצאות בבית, אמהות לוקחות ילדים מבית הספר, מחזירות ילדים מבית הספר. זה סוג נוסף של מסרים. Coming from a context of Libya specifically, which is a conservative, has been closed up, <laughs> uh, maybe even almost North Korea style in the 90s, um, that as a young woman who obviously has a certain set of beliefs, uh, when I, I'm perceived as more westernized or someone who might bring to, who's, who's bringing ideas that do not exactly make sense to the context. Um, so that's a challenge because I have to break that initial barrier. I constantly have to break the initial barrier that, no, I'm just like you, I just dress differently or I just look differently. Karama has been running for 17 years, a program for women. They call it the Leadership and Law Summer Program, LLSP, in Washington, DC. The program brings women from all over the world to learn about the how to understand the Islamic Sharia, especially when it applies to women issues. One of the women who attended one of, uh, in one of the years who was suffering from being in an, in an abusive relationship and being forced to stay in the relationship under the impression that a good Muslim woman should accept such a situation came out of this program realizing that I am a good woman when I stand up for myself and not to accept to stay in an abusive relationship. And that, those were the steps that she took afterwards. We are continuously struggling with patriarchy on every level. Patriarchy is not only in the books and in the jurisprudence, it's also in the societal culture influences that may get in the way of spreading the word of karama or raising doubt about its authenticity and about the appropriateness of what we are doing. I'm extremely grateful to the Arnold program and to Henry and Georg Arnold who established this foundation and allow people like me to come and reflect on their work and try to come up with more innovative, creative practices that promote human rights and sustainable peace. Part of our ideology and theory of um, decentralized power is that each of these videos is also available online and can be watched in a different sequence in for different purposes. So we are not only determining which, which sequence people are going to watch it, but allowing people to create their own playlist based on their needs and interests.